This little marvel of engineering is the Venturer Plug and Play. It's a very standard looking controller with quite a bit of heft to it. You've got a power switch at the bottom, two shoulder buttons on the top, four face buttons to the side, a reset and start button, and a shield style directional pad. The system runs on three AA batteries and outputs directly to Composite Video, the height of gaming sophistication. Now you'd probably be expecting me to say that this is the worst controller ever, but it's actually not. This feels very solidly built. All the buttons are clicky and responsive. The shield style D-pad is very nice, making it incredibly easy to control any game you play. In fact, the overall quality of this build is similar to that of a classic Sega Genesis or Mega Drive controller. Shocking, I know. But build quality aside, you know there has to be something wrong with this thing to be on this show. Inside, nestled in all this plastic lies the heart of an 8-bit clone system modeled after an NES. You know what that means, folks? NES games don't make use of all of these buttons. So the four face buttons here, you have circle and square, and on the top buttons above circle and square, yeah, they're just turbo buttons. And the shoulder buttons up here, they're also repeats of circle and square, but now they're harder to reach. What were they thinking? Now, despite this being an NES style system, you don't have a select button. Instead, your start button sits right beside a reset button, which is very easy to hit, causing multiple instances of pain and sorrow as you accidentally reset the console, eliminating all your progress on any game you happen to be playing. If you care. Because speaking of games, my friends, we've got plenty of them. 25 titles built right in. Each one, from what I can tell, is an original game and not just a quick stolen ROM. These are all apparently made and coded from scratch, even if they happen to be heavily inspired by other games. So, for your pleasure, I present The Venturer. When you power on the system, you're greeted to the game selection menu. Upon your first look, this scene of a stage with an audience down below doesn't seem that out of the ordinary. But look closer. While you clearly can see this Indiana Jones looking fellow off to the right, it's the people around him that look extra creepy. Most of these people appear to be bald. Or possibly skinless? No, no, look at them, they are definitely skulls. You can clearly see that if you just look close enough. Why would some cowboy be sitting with an audience of the dead? Is this some kind of cowpoke purgatory? Perhaps this is some kind of macabre stage show presenting the true evils within, a vicious collection of nightmare-inducing games that this buckaroo has cultivated over the years. Has he forced these poor souls to play these games until their life force is completely siphoned? Are they now doomed to sit idle by for eternity watching the fates of future victims join the ranks? Will I succumb to the same fate? Well, I sure hope not! My dear viewers and fellow travelers, let's begin this grim voyage the only way I know how. Catching fishies. Fish Catcher. Witness the rolling waters of a powerful ocean as fish leap from its salty depths. Your goal in this game? To catch these fish as they jump into view. How do you do it? A fishing rod? A net? Why no? Use your hands! Because in this game, you're Inspector Gadget with an extendable arm, crushing fish with your paws, like a hungry bear. I'm almost positive that the creators of this game have never seen the ocean or know how people actually catch our little aquatic friends. The game's got a time limit, so you need to catch enough fish before the time runs out. Each stage progresses with catching more and more fish. What's the challenge? Well, apparently bullet bills from Super Mario are also fish now, I guess. And if you catch one of those, you'll lose a life and need to restart the stage, resetting your fish counter to zero. It's tedious, it's boring, and somehow it's worse than actually fishing. Continuing on our oceanic theme, we've got Sea War. You're in control of a battleship, dropping mines into the ocean to eliminate your many submerged foes. This doesn't seem so bad on first inspection, does it? Heck, some of these underwater vessels even look like submarines. Except for this one, and this one, and... Oh, oh, okay, that's just a spaceship from Futurama! You might be hoping for good gameplay here, but <laughs> you're really not going to get it. Because you see, this is a ripoff of a game called Death Charge, released back in the 70s in arcades. While the graphics in this version are way more detailed and colorful, it's also very, very glitchy. 
Your ship glitches when you move left or right, making it very difficult to be precise in any of your movements. Even the submarines underneath have a potential to glitch as well, which makes it really hard to aim at them. But the worst part is when an enemy fires at you. Sometimes the projectiles glitch and get caught in the center of the screen, which can make it really difficult to avoid attacks. This is just a pale imitation of a game that was created decades ago. And at the end of the day, all I wanna do is toss this game 20,000 leagues under the sea. From here, we leave the cold waters of the ocean floor and zoom out to the stars above. This is Star Ally. Now, don't get your hopes up. This is a pretty formulaic vertical shoot 'em up. You've got lengthy scrolling space levels, waves of cannon fodder enemies, and power ups. Now, if you ask me personally, I like the power up labeled B because B stands for Break the Game. And why do I say that? It's because the enemy enclave can be shredded to pieces pretty effortlessly with it. The weapon itself is just a homing attack that takes absolutely everyone out without end. Unfortunately though, your weapon power-ups don't carry over from one level to the other, and they most certainly don't stay with you when you die. And, <laughs> you will. In this game, the hitboxes are completely and totally unfair. You're gonna struggle to zip between enemy shots, especially when the game sends in enemies to shoot at you from the corners that are near impossible to hit. Even the almighty Weapon B cannot touch that, which is placed in a corner. For these corners are sacred and nothing shall harm them. Overall though, this game feels super unfair. And we notice something here that's gonna affect every other game on the plug and play, it doesn't save your high scores. So what was the point you might be asking of putting a high score board in the game if it wasn't gonna save? I don't know. Let's have a look at another shooter on the venture, Bolt Fighter. When you start this one up, the main menu scrolls automatically if you don't press any buttons. That's an interesting design choice that just happens, but whatever. In this game, you're back on Earth, plowing through enemies in your cool pink jet. Bubblegum jet aside, just like Star Ally, you've got various item pickups, but there seems to be far less variety here. Where this game doesn't seem the most creative with the abilities that you pick up, it did kind of surprise us in other ways. For example, there's more than one level. How quaint. It's not just the same background asset scrolling again and again. Well, I mean, it sorta is for each stage, but once you pass the stage, it's a whole other endless scrolling asset. I mean, that's not lazy at all. Also of note, there are multiple bosses in Bolt Fighter. Sure, they are pathetically easy, but, but they're here. The game has all of the elements of a basic shooter, but it's really bare bones and any player with even a little skill will find this to be a cakewalk. Heck, I beat all four levels of Bolt Fighter before I found out that I had a screen clearing bomb attack, which probably would have been useful if I found there to be any difficulty in this game. Bolt Fighter leaves a lot to be desired, but hey, there are more shooters on this console that might be better than this one. Last Cobra. Wait, what's a Cobra? D did they mean Cobra? Is there a snake flying this jet? H hold on, let me run a search. What is a Cabra? Oh, it's Spanish for goat? So the title is Last Goat? With the infinite wonders of the world, the, the many wild and vicious creatures that may strike fear into the hearts of the masses, panther, tiger, jaguar, they went with goat? Hey. But you know what? Maybe a goat makes sense because there is definitely some kind of weird animal behind the flight stick of the controls in this game. They are ultra sensitive. You barely press left or right and you're just zooming around the screen. And funny enough, while you have crazy fast sensitive controls, the game often comes to a crawl with slowdown. And it seems to happen the most when there are far too many enemies on the screen at once. You can tell that far less effort went into this one than the last two games, but by far the worst part of this game is the enemies that just spawn into the middle of the screen. There is no warning at all, they just appear, and because all it takes is one hit to down you, you'll find yourself losing this game again and again. I played this game for as long as I could, but nothing ever seemed to change. It's just the same scrolling background with the same enemies appearing with the same generic boss battle. It is relentless, and the only real threat that you have when playing this game at all is when you get destroyed by cheap insta-poppin' enemy dirtbags. Arrow Engine 
Let us venture back into the stars as we dive into our last and by far worst shoot 'em up on the console. This is a clear R type ripoff, and it's not ashamed of it. You can collect up to three power ups to max out the firepower of your spacecraft. But once you do that, this game is functionally broken. Oh, oh. Don't believe me? Well, here I am playing the game, locking my ship in the center of the screen, and just holding down the fire button. Nothing can stop me. I can't be destroyed by any of the enemies, and even the ever-repeating boss battle doesn't have a chance. To make it just that much worse, the stage never changes and nothing can escape your raw firepower. You'll get a perfect score every single time, which seemingly infuriates the game because after a couple of minutes of play, it runs out of memory or something and completely crashes. Folks, this is just the sixth game on the system. What could possibly be next? The threads of society have frayed. Every major city has been devastated. The planet is clutched in the cold, all-encompassing silence of a nuclear winter. Yet somewhere, amongst the chilled ash of crumbled concrete, a huge metal canine tail wags for a better tomorrow. Wolf, I am Ultra Doggy. He is my greatest creation, and is our final hope. For he is a good boy. Yup, this is a thing that we're gonna deal with today. You wouldn't know it by its title screen, but this is a Frogger clone. And what a clone it is! It does nothing right and barely even resembles the slick and easy to play game that is Frogger. This Robo Rover has one goal, get to the other side of the street. But unfortunately for this canine traveler, and you as the player, the levels are designed like a maze. The game begins with Ultra Doggy moving ultra slow. And I mean really slow. The pup's movement is about on par with the vehicles you'll find on the road. That is, until you find a red sock. Is he a baseball fan? Is the sock loaded with batteries? I have no idea. But when he gets it, he moves way faster. My question is though, why hold this speed behind a sock power-up? I don't know, but many of the levels cannot be completed unless you pick that sock up. You're looking at this stage and you're probably thinking that as soon as you get to the other side of the road, the level would be over. Well, you'd be wrong, because this Cyber K9 needs a purple key first to open the gate. And when you get that key and open that gate, don't you dare think you're done on this stage. Go back into the road and find another purple key to open another gate that was behind the gate you just opened. And for every gate you open, the vehicles move faster and faster. Sure, this might be fun, <laughs> maybe, but what makes this whole thing so bad was that, like I mentioned earlier, these stages are mazes, and Power Puppy here can easily get stuck on the corners of the alleyways and walls. And to add just a touch more difficulty, because you really needed to be a bit more harder at this point, the hitboxes on the doggo are awfully big. Even the wind by a vehicle will smack this puppy down for the count. This game just needs to play dead. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm sick of roaming the streets on foot. Let's play a couple games that let you get behind the wheel. First up, we have Motor Rally. This is the epitome of lazy game design. Gaze in pure wonder and awe at the biker whose animation freaks out when you push a single button. Hum Attempt to ride your little motorbike only to realize that it's not really that small in the first place as you pass your first electric telephone pole. Surprise, you're a giant. Now, how do you complete this so-called race? Well, you have to meet certain distance goals in a set time. The game gives you the nice round number of two minutes and eight seconds every time, and you must travel 4,118 uh, mystery units, I guess. There are other bikers and obstacles in your path, but they don't provide much of a challenge. Once you complete this one single race, you win the whole game. But don't think for a second that your time on this exact same motorcycle is over, because we've got a sequel, son! VR Racing 
First up, full stop, this isn't VR. And I should know, I tried playing it with the most sophisticated hardware available. Nope, this is like Moto Rally, but with just a couple of differences. Here, you can choose from several locations, like Egypt, a random city, what looks like a pile of plates, or a shipyard. Unlike Moto Rally, you have the ability to make turns in this game, and it's about as awful as you'd probably imagine. When you hug a corner in this game, or when a turn of the road approaches you, your bike loses all grip on the road. You slingshot to the opposite side, regardless of how you take the turn. Speed up, slow down, it doesn't matter. And you know what else doesn't matter in this game? Obstacles, like oil slicks that do nothing, or hitting competitors when you're taking a turn, which also does nothing. Little things in this game just drive me crazy, like how your speedometer shows that you can go faster, but your bike speed tops off at 160 kilometers an hour. And it's not like you ever feel like you're actually going that fast anyway. And the game has visual issues too, like all the other ones we've looked at. This one though has the tire pushing down onto the heads up display. But if you're really wondering about the quality poured into VR racing, just check out the shipyard level. Yikes, it unintentionally looks like a massive wave is picking up everything in the distance and heading right for you. Don't race towards that, you fools, it's your doom. Speaking of an impending horrible fate, I'm gonna tell you all about Excel Racing. When I heard the name, I thought it was a game about a bunch of eggheads in an office finishing up their spreadsheets as quickly as possible. And you know what? That would be better than what this game actually is. This isn't a race at all. There are vehicles, sure, but this is more of a Pac-Man clone without the dots or the charm. You see, in this game, what you're doing is collecting flags. Every time you collect enough flags and return back to your home street, well, you complete a stage and move on to the next one. But each next stage you go to increases the amount of flags you need to collect by exactly one. A couple of other cars come barreling towards you and you only have one attack to defend yourself with. And that attack is laying a bomb down. This is only a minor inconvenience for your foes though, who quickly shake off their confused state to run you off the road. And this right here, this is the problem with the game. The AI for these enemies isn't wild or unpredictable or even clever. They just hunt you down without mercy. And there are only so many streets. So when all the vehicles kind of come at you all at once, you don't have any options. And even when you use one of those bomb attacks to knock out one of those enemies, you can't drive through them. So that road is always blocked. Least in Pac-Man, you've got the power pellets that can make you go through ghosts. And this, you got nothing. About the only interesting thing that this game has going for it is that they stole the level design from one of those weird city placemat things that you might have had as a kid. GP Race. This game goes by many, many names, but I know it as Konami's forever clone title, Road Fighter. In the past, I've seen this game replicated again and again and again, but this is the worst I have ever seen it. There is no time limit, but what you do have is a fuel limit, and regardless of what you do, including staying perfectly still, your fuel constantly runs out. That's right, folks, your fuel continues to go down even if you crash and no longer exist on the screen. It just keeps depleting. And when you hit zero fuel, it's game over. So you're probably asking yourself, what is the goal in this game? To reach the end of a stupid road, of course. Folks, this is my Everest. In many other games, the obstacles and opposing vehicles that may come across you could prove a challenge. But see, this challenge may contribute to amazing gameplay in most instances, inspiring return playthroughs to push past previous times, but not here. The hit detection is way off. Obstacles are pelted at you without any chance of avoiding them. And if that road happens to curve, <laughs> if it curves, your chances of survival are near impossible. There is only one thing that could possibly help you survive a stage, and that's by picking up fuel. But just like all the other obstacles on the levels, fuel is tossed at you so fast and unpredictably that there is no time to react to its placement. 
they could have easily ripped off any game, copied anything that had a sense of good game design. But for these developers of this crappy title, they decided to lift wholesale a game that was already bad and make it even worse than the original with twitchy controls and smaller bits of gameplay that are broken. It's incredible. This should be in a hall of fame of horrible. After these racing games, I gotta try something that'll put a little flame under me and inspire me to keep going. Oh, how about Dragonfire? Ooh, let me guess. A once great city is in a state of panic as it finds that it must protect itself from an enclave of evil bent on the destruction of everything and everyone within. In their desperation, they turn to a small child, a chosen one, who carries an amulet that has been passed down from generation to generation. This forbidden jewelry holds the power to summon an ancient god, Et Tuamdam, the Dragon King. He who wields the awesome fury of pure eternal fire. The child must find the courage and skill to control this incredible weapon to vanquish the foes of his homeland, express his true emotions to Princess Honeybee, and help Xiao Zhu, the baby Dijin, find his way back to his birth parents. It's Snake? Okay, okay. Let's hope that this next game actually has something to do with fire. Firefighter. Oh, I've seen this game before on plenty of consoles we've covered in the past. You're a firefighter who does indeed fight fires. On a trampoline? Oh, I know a bunch of you clever viewers are probably screaming, That's not a trampoline! That's called a life net! Well, Columbo, you'd be right any other time but today. Life nets catch people, which is what some fighter fighters actually use. This is a trampoline because our fearless firefighting hero keeps bouncing off of it. In this game, you propel your character from window to window, saving peoples and hurling your body into fires. Because grievous bodily harm, that's how you douse flames. But here's the really fun thing though. You know how you get a really high score? Don't save anyone. This ain't a joke. You get bonuses for not saving people. In fact, the less people you save, the more bonuses you get after each stage. It's like you're in cahoots with the hospital. The more people that need to seek medical attention from their burns, the better. Maybe, just maybe, there's some conspiracy that these so-called firefighters have with local healthcare officials that- Wait, are, are we on the moon now? Okay, I'm lost. Next game! Bingo Zap! Remember that old game where you'd punch a hole in a board and try and get a marble to fall through that hole by awkwardly shifting the board around? No? Well, neither do I. Controls? Bad. Level design? Non-existent. Timer? Broken. This game has no end, and it's a mix of not being challenging while also being impossible to play. Bingo Zap. It'll zap all the enjoyment out of your life. Now, this would be the worst entry in the ball falling into a hole genre, but this console, and I can't believe I'm saying this, has another one. Buckle in, cause it's time for Pinball Track. This is not pinball, don't even get me started, cause I know what pinball looks like, and this ain't it. Pinball Track has you controlling a ball in a maze that has you collecting an item, like a key to unlock a gate, that you open to reach the end of the maze. Seems simple, right? Well, this dumb game doesn't even have the basic courtesy of being somewhat playable. Now that bingo zap game that we just came from, that game is awful, no going back on that. But in that game, your goal is to put a ball in a hole. Pinball Track has you keeping your ball out of any holes, which is pretty difficult when you can't see them. Black holes against a black background on a black maze. You can't see nothing. If by some miracle you happen to beat the odds in hit level two, like I did, the stage turns purple and blue, and surprise, you can see the freaking holes now. I've never played a game that got easier on an advanced stage before. Typically, that's not how games are made, but don't think you've escaped because if you happen to pass level two on level three, you're right back into the darkness. And once you made it to this stage, you'll never beat it. Oh, I'd spend more time trying to beat this game, but I have a lot of other titles to take a look at. And on this console, there is one more ball game, and it doesn't even have a ball in it. Push the ball.
You know what? Let's change the name to Push the Puck, because that's what you're actually pushing around. This is obviously air hockey. You're playing in some weird futuristic bar. Your first opponent is Robo McGreenips here, and his name is Neural. That's what it says here. Well, what's your name? Uh, Vizine? I guess your parents were fans of moist eyes? The game is more difficult than you would imagine. You're not just moving a paddle left and right, but forwards and backwards as well. There's very little flow and motion to this game, and everything feels hard and static, making it a chore to play. The only way to win a match is to get 15 goals against your opponent before they can, meaning it is possible for you to play this game for 29 consecutive rounds before someone finally wins. Now, if you do happen to get enough of these pucks to go into that robot's belly button, the game isn't over. They introduce a new opponent, Lexin, who doesn't seem to fit the scene at all. We were just duking it out with a robot, and now it looks like we're facing someone from Lord of the Rings. Now, you might be thinking that Lexin plays just like Neural, but you're wrong. Lexin is a puck demon, a queen of the paddle. She's vicious and fast, and seems to predict every move you make with near perfect accuracy. About the only fault she has is that whoever programmed the game didn't do it well enough, and sometimes the puck just casually slips by for a goal, even if she clearly stopped it. When you get past Lexin, you face the game's final opponent, the dark, mysterious, creepy Skip. We can't be sure who this character truly is, and there is no backstory at all, but we're quite certain that Skip is not human. Oh, how do we know? <sighs> We've got a gut feeling. Really, all this game has going for it is its characters. It's just like Pong, but Pong plays better. Up to this point, all of these games have been pretty mindless. So let's get into something that helps us use our brains. How about some puzzle games? On this system, we've got three puzzle games to look at. Jewel Master, Mufun, and Wysen. Now, Jewel Master and Mufun are essentially just Columns and Bejeweled, and there's really nothing special about these versions. They play very badly, and they've got very questionable looking graphics. But Wysen is funny, because with that game, they clearly gave up on titling their games. What does Wysen even mean? In the game, you take random puzzle shapes and rotate and place them until you fit each one of them into a frame. I was kind of excited when I first saw this game because even though it seemed to be insanely boring, it at least promised over 50 levels of gameplay. I mean, even at its worst, at its most basic, a random shaped puzzle game can at least be somewhat enjoyable, or so I thought. Each and every one of these stages uses the same exact eight shapes over and over. It really doesn't feel like a lot of work went into this, and to be honest, the only thing that was really exciting was... <clears throat> yeah, that. After playing for a while, the game becomes massively unstable and does this. How fun. Elfland. Are there actually elves in Elfland? This is debatable, but one thing is for certain, there are gigantic jars of colored preserves all over the place. You are the fancy-hatted jam ghost. You must cocoon yourself in delightful jellies to the horror of your enemies, and once you match the same color that they are, you destroy their physical forms. Yes, they are finally freed from this malicious marmalade mausoleum as they ascend to what we can only assume is eternal bliss. But then, you thwart them once again. You see, this here is one sour specter. Think you're moving on to the great beyond, Cherub? Bam, you're an apple. Want a quiet afterlife, Angel? Ba-boom, you're a baby bottle. Truth be told, you might in fact enjoy this game. It plays kind of like Bubble Bobble or Snow Brothers. But after just a few brief seconds of play, this game, like many of the others we've looked at, crashes. We tried playing through it several times and the game continued to break. And not even at the same sections. It just seems that we may never unravel the weird dark mysteries of this here jam ghost. It's one of life's greatest regrets. Next up are two sports games, because every one of these systems seems to have sports games, don't they? Golden Arrow and Dart Champion. You wanna know what these games are? 
Well, they're, they're stolen from track and field. As weird as it is, they're not the exact same ROMs from actual track and field. They seem to be recreations of the exact same assets that you'd find in those games. These are just really bad, and everything that would be good about track and field, which arguably isn't that much to begin with, is simply done completely improperly here. It seems almost impossible to aim in Golden Arrow, and don't even get me started with Dart Champion. See those little boxes there? That's where your character is aiming. In no version of this game are you actually moving the boxes. They are supposed to automatically lock on to those little clay pigeons that get shot in front of the character. All you're supposed to do is push one button to shoot left and another to shoot right. That's the game. But the task is rendered impossible when the squares don't want to match up with the clay pigeons. I mean, how do you even screw this up? It only takes two seconds to have played this to know that it's not working properly. But I guess even that was just too long to make sure they made a staple game. All right, folks, you want to go real boring? Here's a game called Grass Cutter. This wonderful little game begins with a title screen that showcases the lawn you're about to cut, and that lawn is in front of a lighthouse in the middle of a field. Call me crazy, but I don't think the developers know what lighthouses do or where they should be located, because as far as I know, they're not supposed to be in fields. Anyway, what do you want me to say, folks? You probably guess what this game is just by the title. It's a game where you cut grass. Your character is half of a pudgy Sonic the Hedgehog with tiny little hooves. Eh, gotta mow fast. And you move your lawnmower around, mowing, well, the lawn. It feels like a game your parents coded to trick you into thinking yard work wasn't horrible. Well, it is. And so this is the game. About the only thing that could make this game worse is if it started raining. Oh. Good, good, it's raining now. Just a tiny rain cloud, but it makes a little patch of grass grow. Right there, that's your enemy in the game, the freaking elements. Unlike a couple of other games on this collection, this one does eventually end after you complete 10 stages, but they all look the same, and no matter what, you're just cutting grass. Catch the egg. By this point, hit detection and bad controls are a given, but this one seems to be the worst offender for controls on the entire list of games. You have no doubt been able to discern from the images of this game that your goal is to catch eggs in a frying pan and avoid bombs. Kind of like that catch the fish game we were playing earlier all the way at the beginning. You would assume that the controls would be virtually identical, but that isn't the case. I'm gonna do my best to describe this because I don't think I have the capacity to demonstrate just how awful this thing truly is. Imagine if you greased your entire body up with butter and jumped straight into a bowling lane. The sense you would get from that as you flailed, attempting to correct your trajectory, but ultimately nothing could stop your oncoming fate of smashing your face into a bunch of bowling pins. Strike. That, that's exactly how it feels, but maybe worse. The controls bounce around, ramping up and slowing down, making pixel-perfect precision catches of eggs utterly futile. But if you thought they couldn't make an egg-catching game worse than this, <laughs> folks, I invite you to the final game of today's showcase, and it's a sequel to this game. Birdie Nest. A pelican sits atop an invisible pole. A pole that, by the way, you need to balance. Move too quickly left or right and the pelican will fall to its doom. If only it could fly. But that's besides the point. This pelican has a gift to give you. As a reward for this careful balancing act, it will send down fresh, warm, golden eggs. But be cautious, young squire, for there are nuggets of the golden variety adrift along the salty sea breeze that you do not want to catch. I'm talking real, 100% golden pelican pellets. Poop. Every time you catch one, you lose a life. But this whole scenario, as bizarre as it is, is utterly confusing. I don't want to have a philosophical debate on wanting to catch golden eggs. I think we're all on the same page about how awesome they are. It's the golden poopies, though, that I've got a real problem with. 
First off, that's not how pelican poop looks. I'm not saying I'm an expert, I'm really, really not. But I've seen birds poop before, and it looks more like somebody filled their mouth with whiteout and then got punched in the gut. I can't believe I'm gonna say this, but this looks like a dog turd, a golden dog turd. Which brings me to my next point, why do we not want this delightfully dazzling duty? No, 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 before you stop the video, hear me out. Sure, it's a poopy, but it's a golden poopy. Now look, I don't know if that golden egg was solid or not. We've all seen those chocolate Easter bunny candies that actually have just a hollow egg of chocolate with nothing inside. But have you ever seen a hollow poop? I think not. What you're looking at here is one steaming solid lump of gold. We're taking perfectly good dung and tossing it aside like it's worthless. I completely and totally disagree with losing a life every time you grab it. If anything, you could be grabbing the poop and the eggs. More gold for everyone, right? Right? And honestly, if given the choice between playing this game for another second longer or just taking one of those golden poops, well, folks, I think you'd know what I'd take. Maybe I'm wrong, dear viewers, but if there's one thing I can tell you about all of the games on this collection, including this last one, is that everything on here is crap. So this is another in a long line of terrible systems that we've looked at on the show, but it did do one thing right. And that one thing was not actually stealing any of the code for the games they featured on here, even if they happened to steal the visuals. But what it did do wrong though, was absolutely everything else.